tonight on Great Performances. African-American choreographers emerged on the concert stage and brought their own distinctive stories with them as Dance in America presents Free to Dance. Great Performances is brought to you by Ernst & Young, providing a fresh financial perspective on business so you can move ahead quickly and confidently in today's new economy. Ernst & Young, from thought to finish. Major funding for this program was provided by the Ford Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding our understanding of the world, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Black Programming Consortium, committed to innovative black programming, the Lewester T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Irene Diamond Fund, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The American Dance Festival and the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts production of Free to Dance. Haiti, 1936. For Catherine Dunham, the American dancer and anthropologist, Haiti is the last leg of a year-long study of Caribbean dance. Her research into why black people dance the way they do should have been completed by now, but she's reluctant to go home. The more she observes, the more she understands. Dunham was tracing her own roots. You know, her roots as a black person, a person of African ancestry. She would have seen dance as a means of communicating, as a means of expressing life and living itself. The European influence now is also there. But the slaves and their descendants took many of the, the, the European influences and transformed them. And that is what the dance is about. I wanted to know what drove her, what made her go to the roots of her heritage. Her answer was really simple. She wanted to dignify the material. She had seen how this material that she was using as her source was such an integral part of the culture that it came out of. She wanted to bring that as truly and honestly as she could and put it on stage and show people its, its beauty and its glory. In Catherine Dunham's United States of 1936, the limit of what the black dancer could achieve is known as Negro dance. Well, if you were a black dancer, all you could aspire to was to be a shake dancer or a tap dancer or a contortionist or an acrobat, because that's all that was open to you. We needed to see another vision of what black dancers could do. The black dancer did not have a choice. Maybe if they were my skin color or maybe a little bit lighter, they might be able to get into the chorus line. They could not be in any of the evolving concert stage because they were black. They were between a rock and a hard place, literally. I had gained enough knowledge in the West Indies that I knew that I was doing some things from a point that was quite different from what the average person would see when he went to the theater or a rehearsal. When Dunham returns to Chicago, 
she realizes that new choreography will have to wait. She must first teach her dancers the movements she's experienced and their spiritual dimension. She tells her company they'll learn the steps of the gods. When she came back from Haiti, it was quite a revelation because we found ourselves doing things that did not even seem to me like dance anymore. There were a lot of voodoo movements and pelvic movements that our families were horrified when they saw us doing. A whole different concept of dance because we learned the spiritual part of the dance. In time, these movements become the foundation of an approach to dance known as the Dunham Technique, based on the principle of isolation. She formed this incredible movement system that is uh, still prevalent today, although she's not given credit for it. You learn to move each part of your body separately, as though it has no connection with the other part of your body. This was isolation of everything, the hands, shoulders, hips. The movement of the head, the snap of the finger, the wiggle of the knees and legs. I don't think anyone ever mastered it as well as she did. And contract. Dunham builds her technique on her knowledge of ballet, modern, and Afro-Caribbean dance. It covers the whole range of training the body to move. What was added were the African elements. Her technique was the hardest technique I'd ever done. You did all the head movements, head moves at the side. Head movements, I had never done this before, where she said, pull through the ear and go off on the side. All these things, spinning the head around. So the head dances. Then we went to the shoulders. And up and down, and up and down. To the rib cage. And out. Chest way up, clear. To the hips, how to contract the hips front, isolate the hips to the side, to the back, to the side. How to circle the hips up and down. Take the hands up. Then you put all that together and you move across the floor. Right. 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 But of all of the Caribbean movements Dunham teaches, the most exciting comes from the island of Martinique. There, men perform a fighting dance called the Agia, a fusion of African and European combat styles. The Agia developed because slaves were not allowed to possess weapons. The Agia is martial art disguised as dance. As a tool, Dunham uses film she shot in Martinique to teach the dance to her company. She decides to build her first new choreography around the drama of the Agia. Dunham premieres her dance in Chicago on January 27, 1938, less than a year after her return from the West Indies. It was just a love story of a fishing village I was a fisherman, she was the girl, and the devil was the other one, who was mean. But it, it, it was just a, a Romeo and Juliet. Catherine Dunham is one of those people who could be dismissed as an anthropologist, lifting things from the field onto the stage, not at all. She was an artist as well, and uh, in fact, a theatrical artist. She understood the theater of much of what she saw in the field. She knew that she wanted to make this material palatable to a broad audience. 
but she was definitely going for the heart and the essence of a culture. Lagia becomes an instant success. But Caribbean-inspired material is not all Dunham wants audiences to appreciate. All along, she sought to build respect for African-American themes as well. The chance to do this comes when the company is invited to New York City. In a new show for Broadway, Tropics and La Jazz Hot, she creates a duet she calls Barrel House Blues. It's based on the slow drag, a couple's dance common to the juke and the honky-tonk. The piece is controversial for audiences in 1940. Barrel House Blues was depicting the time in Chicago when it was cold, and just knowing this lonely woman who felt a little beat up went on in a bar and, and had the time of her life, just for a moment, finds this young man and fantasizes. <laughs> The critics were just baffled. They were ignorant to the fact that this was a combination of the authentic with the artistic. So they reverted back to their safety of, it was sizzling, it was hot, it was torrid, it was sexy and all that business. Though the reviews are enthusiastic, they're laced with a tone of condescension. John Martin, America's leading dance critic, calls Barrel House Blues an incredible vulgarity in the New York Times. Like any innovator, you're bound to give your audience trouble, and Catherine Dunham did. What they saw, many a critic dismissed as cabaret and they felt it had no depth. That wasn't true. It was sassy, and she was courageous. She would always take risks, always with her material, even though they may uh, criticize her, like maybe that was too risque. She wanted them to know we're complex people. Here's someone who said this is important, vernacular dance. The idea of looking at the blues experience in the body, the idea of looking at the jazz experience in the body, the idea of looking at the spiritual experience in the body through dance, that's a powerful legacy. John Martin said, when he was reviewing Catherine, it's not designed to delve into philosophy or psychology, but to externalize the impulses of a high-spirited, rhythmic, and gracious race. And I asked Catherine at one point about her feelings about John Martin's take on what she did. And she said, in this very, very ladylike, subdued way, he was trying to be helpful. And that's essentially the way you have to look at it. The man's not trying to be malicious. He's not trying to be mean. He just doesn't get it. And he's not the only critic who didn't get it. Celebrity ignites a hectic pace for Dunham. She lectures at Eastern colleges on Caribbean culture, writes magazine articles for Esquire under the pseudonym K. Dunn, and lands a starring role in the hit Broadway musical, Cabin in the Sky. What she had was a combination of magnetism, sexuality, and pure impact that can only be described as star quality. She had that power that when she came upon the stage, you had to look at her. This was Catherine Denham. 
she was helped a great deal by her husband, John Pratt, who was such a creative person with lights and sets and, and knew just how to costume her. John Pratt was such an integral part of Catherine Dunham and the Catherine Dunham Company. You might want to call him Mr. Catherine Dunham, but he was stronger than that. It was a fascinating relationship because they were both very strong. They were both geniuses at what they did, and I know Miss Dunham inspired him. Dunham also acquires a reputation as a woman to be reckoned with. In 1943, she tangles with the director of the film, Stormy Weather. Stormy Weather stars Bill Bojangles Robinson and Lena Horne, but it's Dunham who steals the show. Well, there's that wonderful scene in Stormy Weather when um, there's the kind of breakaway and Lena Horne is standing beside the window. Of course, Lena's the star of, of Stormy Weather, but let's face it, when we pan away to Catherine Dunham and she stands with her, her 40s fashions, the hat tilted to the side of the head, one sees power. But she actually has to negotiate her place and her sense of self and her sense of who the black dancer was in America at that point with the director of the film. He wanted the whole scene to be the hookers and pimps on the street. She says, no, nothing doing. All of a sudden, we're in another world, a dream world. She has negotiated in that particular film a sense of our perspective on who we are, this larger sense of the black self that we ourselves define. The Dunham Dance Company is one of the best known dance groups in the world. And yet, it is difficult keeping the troupe going. The Donald Company was characterized by the fact that it was constantly in a state of bankruptcy. It could be a little less bankruptcy or a little more, but the basic uh, situation was always uh, either mild or extreme desperation. To pay the bills, the company tours constantly and performs in nightclubs and private functions. Celebrity is a mixed blessing. We were traveling and performing in a, in a time of extreme segregation. In the war years, we got mixed in with troop trains and army personnel would get very hot about it. They'd begin to smolder. They would pass through our car, which they were not supposed to do, and uh, let loose with epithets like, uh, how, come, how come the niggers have got sleeping accommodations and we don't? But Dunham refuses to be intimidated. At every turn, she uses her fame to counter racism. Wherever she goes in the U.S., she tells the press about hotels which deny her accommodation. She rejects engagements before segregated audiences and speaks out on civil rights for Negroes, even during World War II, when some thought it unpatriotic. With the goal of victory overseas and at home, African-American artists used their talent during the war to protest inequality. In 1943, Pearl Primus, a young modern dancer, stuns her audience with a solo about lynching. This is an all-out war, she writes. We will not stop fighting until everyone is free. Primus sets her dance, without music, to the words of Lewis Allen's poem, Strange Fruit. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves, and blood at the root. That a black man had been killed, 
he had been hung, maybe he had been shot, that a black man had to have suffered these iniquities. And here Pearl Primus, a black dancer, had the audacity to take the story of hate, of sadness, of murder, and put it on the stage as a violent solo. No other dancer had gone that far to do a dance of that style. Pastoral scene of the gallant South. The bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. There was a great deal of pain in the movement as she contorted her body to show the utmost pain and suffering of the human spirit. Scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. And the sudden smell of burning flesh. Despite the unsettling nature of Primus' solos, she is widely embraced by the modern dance world and by audiences. This notoriety is a surprise, especially to Primus, who wanted first to be a doctor, then an anthropologist. A part-time job takes her to the new dance group, and it's here she hones her dance technique and political edge. The new dance group was a, a very unique organization. They felt that dance was for everyone, and their motto was dance is a weapon for social justice. I think it was the only place in New York that was integrated. It wasn't only one technique or one form, it was everything. And that's what made the new dance group, the fact that not only was it everything in dance, it was also everything in people. But within a year of her debut, Prima stops performing altogether. To create dances of consequence, she feels she has to learn more about black people and their ways. Eager to use her recent training in anthropology, she travels to the Deep South. She ends up in the Black Belt of Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, and immerses herself into everyday life. She disguises herself as a migrant farm worker, picking cotton, harvesting fruit, practically any work that would let her learn by observation and participation. I think that the pull to anthropology by African American women is this pull to try to understand their own role, their marginal role in American society. And they become true participant observers and try to bring back different notions of what it means to be a woman, what it can mean to be an African-American. As her experiences unfold, all that Primus observes becomes potential source material. She pays particular attention to how ordinary people move at work and at play, noting how similar these movements are among black folk. but it's the religious rituals of rural blacks that have the greatest impact on her. She's searching for the roots of African-American spiritualism that informs uh, our religious rituals with dance movement, with uh, almost extroverted expression of, of spiritual fervor and it's that the body is inhabited by these spirits, and they come out. Primus creates a slew of new dances based on her southern field work, often performing at political rallies and fundraisers. Her most famous piece, Hard Time Blues, heightens her reputation as an activist artist. Folks 
start starving, please don't close your door. They had hard, hard times, Lord, all around. Meal barrels into crops burned to the ground. Great God Almighty, folks, be with bad, lost everything they ever had. Great God Almighty, folks, be with bad, lost everything they ever had. But after the war, Primus pays a price for her militancy. She's called before the House Un-American Activities Committee and has her passport revoked. Once before a performance in Harrisburg, Virginia, she is spat upon, stoned, and called a red. Undeterred, Primus continues to dance. Then, in 1948, the president of the Rosenwald Foundation, which funded Catherine Dunham's research 14 years earlier to the Caribbean, sees Primus perform and offers to fund a research trip for her to Africa. Of the many dances she learns there, her favorite is the first she learns, the fanga. Fanga was a dance of welcome. I ask the earth and the heavens to welcome you. You are a guest in my community. You are a guest in my home. When Pearl introduced us to the Fanga, we studied and listened to the rhythms very closely because the music and the dance were very closely integrated. They were one. Elders in over 30 tribal groups teach Primus their dances. And though she films them for future reference, it is only when she joins in that she grasps the full meaning of dance. This was a way for her to be there firsthand as a witness, as a participant, uh, as part of the culture. And she stayed there long enough to really become absorbed in the material that she was studying. And all along, dance is at the center of this cultural exploration, this search for who she is. Africans recognize a strong kinship in her dancing. They give her the name Omawale, which means child returned home. For the next 30 years, Pearl Primus will become one of America's foremost teachers of African dance. She realized the power of Africa and that Africa had something to teach us about negotiating one's identity and meaning in life. It's all been a part of dance for, for blacks. Africa in the Americas is a very important cultural and historical phenomenon. African slaves could preserve things like music and dance. These are things which are outside the reach of the oppressor. So those persisted with a vengeance. There is such a thing as an African cultural continuum in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in um, black North America. There are movements, there are languages, there are artistic expressions that have roots in Africa but have been transformed in the New World. African American artists want to find connections. They take so much from the past and honor it and change it and transform it. And it's that quality that is perhaps most indicative of a black aesthetic. The aesthetic and cultural continuum that stretches from Africa to various black cultures in the New World has always been a potent force. It's passed from one generation to another. It's passed from one body to another through dance. It's passed from one voice to another through music. 
It's a lived tradition. It's a lived tradition. By the late 1940s, young dancers who had cut their teeth with Primus and Dunham begin to leave. Some join established companies which are slowly opening their doors to blacks. Several Dunham dancers choose to teach in the school she creates in 1945. A select few, however, seek their own individual voice and dance. One of Dunham's original dancers, Tally Beatty, is among the first of her company to strike out on his own. People who left her, if they formed a company of their own, they were doing a weak imitation of Catherine Dunham, except one person, Tally Beatty. He was the best dancer that she had. When Tally branched out on his own, he made wonderful works. Tally had power, he had excitement, and he had an amazing technique. Beatty studies and experiments intensely, applying his extensive dance knowledge to create provocative choreography. I can make up steps, I can choreograph a dance very simply, but to really create a dance from an idea and to hold the idea and show my blackness, that interests me most. In his first choreography, Beatty reaches for a highly emotional and technical effect. It is clearly seen in his early solos. I don't think anyone quite danced with such passion as Tally. It was so complete. He was a complete artist in his dance, and all of his passions went into his movements. In 1947, Beatty creates The Mourner's Bench, where the dancer meditates about a life lost through racial violence. It is a sharp departure from his work with Dunham. It's uh, sitting on the mourner's bench. Then it's a personal expression of grief. And he is thinking upon the events of the day. And he's just moving across the bench and looking out, moving across the bench. He would go to a place within himself. It was startling to watch him do it. It feels good to, to give yourself over to the dance, to just let your spirit go on that journey, being connected to the divine um, in the way that you're connected to that when you shout, when you praise in church. The stage is the place where I feel free, where I feel like I can be vulnerable. I can just kind of strip away layers of stuff and open myself out.
are called to do what we do. And because of that, there is a love there. There is a pool there. There is emotionality there. You reach the full spectrum of, of possibility, of emotion within one day. Critics praise the mourner's bench for its passion and masculinity. However, what the modern dance community notices most is the accessibility in the work of emerging black choreographers. African-American choreographers were stretching, really just pushing the edges of the envelope with what modern dance was. Now, the modern dance world had its look and had its feel and had its texture when they came in the door. We would come out of the, the Graham era, the, the Gray Woolens era of Graham, and suddenly, instead of going to Greece and using Greek myths, instead of going to India and using Indian dance, people went home and brought home to the theater in a way that was very, very meaningful, touching, and had this incredible visceral effect on the audience. The impact of homegrown dance is evident in the work of another African-American choreographer, Donald McHale. McHale turns the street play he learned growing up in New York City into a dance he calls Games. I grew up in East Harlem. And East Harlem at the time of my youth there was very mixed. It had originally been a lot of Jewish families there, Italian families, and families from Puerto Rico and the Caribbean islands came in, and black families came in. I had friends in all these different ethnicities. And when I did games, there was no instrumental music uh, because I felt that the way I had played in the street was music being sung, chants, shouts. I went downtown to get my grip. I come back home just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. Donnie McHale is the consummate storyteller in a lot of ways. He told stories about the things that were happening in, uh, in the America that he knew. Just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip, just to pull in the skip. Choreography by Donald McHale brings to mind for me uh, a phenomena that we see actually across the arts in the 1950s. And I would think of it more, I guess I would use the term kind of a new realism, something more political, something more social. I saw a cop walking down the street, swinging his billy and strutting his beat. He's gonna catch you, beat you hard, break all of your bones, so help me go. A sense that there's inequality that also presents itself in, in society. Well, it's early in the morning when I rise and well. In sketching in America, rarely danced on the concert stage, McHale advances the tradition inherited from Dunham and Primus, engaging audiences while exploring difficult themes. In Rainbow Round My Shoulder, he addresses the plight of men on a southern chain game. I had heard uh, chain gang songs from Leon Bibb singing in his recording, and I began to respond to those. In those days, they were literally chained ankle to ankle. And they were rhythmically singing. And I was aware of the rhythm because it was very pronounced. I got a rainbow tied all around my shoulder. I got a rainbow tied all around my shoulder. I got a rainbow. Rainbow is the name that the prisoners give to the pickaxe which they carry over their shoulders, which is in the shape of an arc. My Lord, I'm going home everywhere. 
It was all about striking and punching and hard labor. There was anger in it, a lot of anger. Where I look this morning. All through these songs, there's always this aspiration for freedom. And they always talked about women, something they were kept away from. So I said, the freedom is going to be in the shape of a woman. I'm going downtown, going to get me a jug of brandy. Give it all to Nancy. Keep her good drunk and goosey all the time, time. Keep her good drunk and goosey all the time. And while I'm downtown, going to get me a sack of flour. Cook it every hour. Keep my skin good and greasy all the time, time. Keep my skin good and greasy all the time. And if she says so, if she says so, I'll never work no more. I'll hang around her shanty all the time. When you look at Rainbow Round My Shoulder, you're looking at snapshots from his from his America. It was a snapshot with a punchline. You know, it was something that showed you not only what that life was like, but told you what that life did to the people who lived it. In the early 50s, uh, the opportunity for a black modern dancer was almost nil. As a consequence, black dancers seek out any chance to perform. In 1954, a special opportunity surfaces, a Broadway musical which assembles African-American dancers from both coasts. One of the really magical moments was when we got together for House of Flowers. At that time, it's very rare to have a show, a musical, that was mainly with people of color, mainly with blacks. The dancers and the performers were, were very excited about something at last coming along that they could do. From the West Coast, the show's choreographer invites Carmen de Lavalade and Alvin Ailey to dance in the production. Ailey and de Lavalade studied modern dance in Los Angeles with Lester Horton, a pioneer who established one of America's first integrated dance companies. Alvin Ailey looked like a running back. If you saw him walk, you say he can't dance. But when he got on the stage, you had to take all that back. All of a sudden, you saw the muscular ease in which he moved. And it was very sensual and almost cat-like, you know. In time, Alvin Ailey comes to realize that there are far too few opportunities for the black dancer. I felt immediately when I got to New York City uh, the need for a modern dance repertory company where I could develop dancers as well as choreographers. Alvin said, I want to start a company because there are too many black modern dancers who don't have a place to perform. And I really think it's time that we have a place. Where black dancers could feel that what they did was important and had value. Alvin would talk about this. Uh, he would talk about his dream. I heard Alvin Ailey's dream before I heard Martin Luther King's dream. <laughs> Alvin just opened his heart to most of us and, and, and we began to listen because he had a kind of urgency.
I had lots of what I call blood memories. Blood memories about Texas, uh, old blues and spirituals and gospel music and uh, ragtime music and folk songs. So the first ballets that I made when I came to New York were based on those feelings. It was dance on a shoestring in a big way. It's just a small company with people from Broadway shows. Couldn't pay them for rehearsal time. And you got a chance to really see right there what made the Ailey dancer. It's a dancer who could do dance dramas. You had to be able to emote on stage. You had to be able to, at the same time, show that technique. You had this blend of modern, jazz, and ballet. He created, almost with an alchemy, he created this whole new way of dancing. Down in New Orleans, that they call the rise I think that the importance of Alvin Ailey is that he fuses the white modern dance tradition with that of Primus and Dunham. He calls his dance company the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And it happens when we can no longer ignore the fact that America is a pluralistic society and that in fact all of these folks deserve to be called American. There was no money at all. If you love what you're doing, then it doesn't matter that you didn't get paid. It was something that we had to do. My first payment from Alvin was a note and a flower. That was it, a thank you note and a flower. He said to me that he wanted to give a a concert, and I said, oh God, Alvin, I'd love to help you, whatever you want me to do. You know, t tell me and I'll do it. And that's how it started, and I did everything for him but dance. He knocked out the word can't, you know, do, do, do. His slightest suggestion that there's a way to do it. And we, we worked for six months to create Alvin Ailey's show. We used to rehearse at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, costume fittings. No one thought anything of it. I mean, this was, just, this was just the way that it had to be done. If you wanted to perform then, you had to use what was available to you. There were no rehearsal studios, nothing like there is now. I mean, it was just a different world. The dance that gels during the months of rehearsal is a suite titled Revelations based on the spiritual music of Ailey's early childhood. The spirituals, Ailey said, were the first music I could almost see. The very first sequence, which has become a kind of signature thing, with those arms reaching up like Gothic cathedrals, very much in the spiritual, reaching up, out, in a kind of anguish. I think it was one of those things that just poured out of him. I think it's all that stuff that he was, that had built up in Alvin, and he just, it just all came out. Alvin Ailey had the ability to, uh, to give you a little bit, and then you took that little bit and took it inside. It's a powerful piece of imagery that's created very quickly for you. Does an artist like Elvin Ailey know that that's going to be universally seen? 
for Alvin to come up with a lady sitting with their fans on a stool, it's just an absolute masterpiece of capturing something you would see in black churches. You would see these ladies very dressed with huge hats and the fans would be all in rhythm. You could look down a pew line and they would all have the same rhythm. Now for Albert Ailey to pick up on a thing like that. The performance went very well, we thought, and we all seemed to know what we were doing. And uh, the end of the piece came, and the curtain came down, and we were standing behind the curtain, holding hands, ready to take our bow, and there was dead silence in the audience. They brought the curtain up, and as they brought the curtain up, the audience jumped to their feet, and you just heard this roar, this deafening roar of bravos and applause and stamping and, and banging on the seats. It was just deafening. And we just sort of like, you know, we looked around like, what's going on? Well, just bow, and we bowed, and we bowed, about 10 curtain calls. And when it was over, no one wanted to leave. They almost asked for an encore to repeat it. It's a powerful dance which in fact expresses to humanity the common nature of all of humanity. Alvin Ailey draws upon that Africanist use of the body. He draws upon that Africanist spiritualism, that African-American spiritualism, and so many themes and elements that African-American dancers had been exploring up to that point. And in Revelations, we see these things come alive on the concert stage in such a powerful artistic statement that modern dance would never be the same again. To find out more, visit pbs.org or America Online keyword, PBS.
Performances is brought to you by Ernst & Young, providing a fresh financial perspective on business so you can move ahead quickly and confidently in today's new economy. Ernst & Young, from thought to finish. Major funding for this program was provided by the Ford Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Endowment for the Humanities, expanding our understanding of the world, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Black Programming Consortium, committed to innovative black programming, the Lewester T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Irene Diamond Fund, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Educators and educational institutions can purchase free to dance on home video cassette for $99 per episode or $199 for the entire series plus shipping. To order, call 1 800 336 1917 or use the fax number on your screen. This is PBS.